Hi, it's Adam Vasquez, and I'm excited to share my recent interview with Russ DeGilio, the founder and CEO of Duck Donuts. And if you're not familiar with Russ, he invented the made-to-order donut market. And if you live on the East Coast of the U.S., chances are you've had a Duck Donut, and you know why they've become one of the fastest-growing franchises in the world. During my interview with Russ, I get to learn more about his journey and sample some amazing food. So thank you, Russ, and to the Duck Donuts family for allowing us to take over your store for a couple hours. And if you're watching this, get ready to take some notes, and I hope you enjoy the episode as much as we did making it. Hey, Russ. Adam, welcome to Duck yeah, Donuts. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming today. Yeah, this is, I've been here a bunch. I've been down to your original duck location, but yeah, show me around. What is Absolutely. It, how's and it work? For, for your viewers who have never been to one of our stores, they're gonna say, where are all the donuts? Well, we're going to show you how we get to the donuts, okay? Awesome. Make awesome. them the order. Come on in. Cool. Let's do it. So I have my favorites. One of mine's the blueberry, and that's really good. But like, what, are, what should I order? I'll let you order okay. just for me, okay? We're going to do a half dozen, okay? Oh, okay. Would you like a cup of coffee? Uh, we have great coffee. Yeah, let's do that too. We'll do $9.75. $9.75. Put it on my tab. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> but I mean, but is it really cool? I mean, I mean, how many flavors? I mean, how many combinations? It's pretty much endless combinations right when you factor in all the the icings the toppings yeah. and the drizzles we call it it's a duckzillion combinations it's too many to count yeah it which really is, is awesome. mathematically so. <laughs> cool let's go make some donuts come on in what our customers get to enjoy is see everything from scratch so there is a science to this yeah. and certain levels of oil our batter has to sit a certain period of time for uh, aeration and uh, when you, when you do it just right, you should get the perfect donut every single time. We are still perfecting yeah. it after 13 years. We're constantly trying to make the experience better, the donut better. We've made some adjustments to our batter, to our shortening, and uh, it continues to improve. Yeah, and, that, and that's a really important piece, right? Because a lot of people think once you launch a product and everything else, it's just done. That's it. But when we talk about market invention, and you're trying to be a market inventor, it's constant iteration. You know, in the technology space, they call it agile, but I mean, it applies to the donut making process too, right? Absolutely. And we're in different parts of the country, and we try and tailor the, uh, the taste of that part of the country with, with toppings and things like that. So, so you do localized flavors too? To, to some degree yeah, we do. Yeah, that's cool. Or regions, maybe not uh, yeah. individual markets. That's now, did you want to top your donuts? Yeah, I would love to. All right, so I would love to. we already washed our hands. I yeah, know that. Yes. So why don't we put on some gloves? Perfect. Okay. So we, we will dip, tip, and flip. Oh, nice. All right. So it's hot. Be careful. Dip. Let it get down there. There you go. Tip. Tip. And flip. Flip. There you go. Ah. You know, we want to do maple bacon. So that's the maple. And that's we'll the cover bacon. it with some bacon, and then we top it off with. Uh, caramel. Some, some caramel sauce. And now we have coconut. Yes. And then you want to drizzle with your raspberry. And then this is a classic. We started with one of the few that we started with. This is cinnamon sugar. You just kind of let it get drenched in that. Cool. And then last we have a chocolate. This is Oreo crumbs. Oh, Oreo crumbs, huh? Okay. And marshmallow. And there's your half dozen. Oh my goodness. Awesome. So we're here, we got the donuts, it's time to eat. So. Adam, this is the reason why we don't case donuts. Look at this. This is made exactly the way you ordered them. They're warm, they're fresh. You can't get them any better than this. Well, this is awesome. So you guys have watched the process. You really now are starting to understand why Russ has been so successful as a marketing inventor and why this concept is just exploding all over the country and all over the world. We'll talk about that too in a little bit, but let's try some of the donuts. We worked hard, let's get into it. Absolutely. So this is the maple. Uh, maple bacon, it is one of our biggest sellers. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. A little messy, but that's okay. Mm. No, no, it's supposed to be. Mm. That is so good. Now, the sweet and the savory and the donut, it's a cake donut, right? I mean, but... Vanilla cake donut, a little crispy on the outside, light and fluffy on the it inside. It is so fluffy and light. It, it, is, it is everything you want 
a breakfast donut at the beach. <laughs> All right. So now the classic. The classic. Which, you know, you Way back when, when we first started, we yeah. only had a few toppings and, and icings. And this has been from the very beginning. One of my favorites. I just, it brings back memories of uh, watching the ocean and uh, doing a crossword puzzle with my coffee and having a cinnamon sugar donut. So let's go back there because we all love the beach and <laughs> we'd all like Especially to be after right there. Today, yeah, I don't exactly. Like to be at the beach. So you, you help yourself and all. So this is just a simple cinnamon sugar, right? Mm hmm. Mm. I just went back there myself. <laughs> I mean, the crazy part is, I mean, there's all this magic to how you have the different toppings. But to be honest, without <clears throat> the, you, you even take the cinnamon sugar away, this is a killer donut. It is a good donut. I mean, just, just, bare. just by yeah. itself. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thank you. This is awesome. So we, we've, we've gone through the process and, and kind of the end result of everything. But we know there's so much more behind this. And it starts off with almost childhood. So what was it like growing up in the DiGilio household? I mean, I was the oldest of five. Okay. I had four sisters and um, four sisters. Huh? Oh, yeah. Wow. And uh, it was I wouldn't say it was overly strict, but it was just we had our rules and uh, you followed them and uh, everything was about family. And yeah. um, um, it's I'm basically a quiet person and I, my father and I were very quiet and I think it was because we had four girls and my mother and uh, they did all the talking and we just yeah. kind of sat there and listened but uh, it was a great family environment and um, being the oldest um, you, you really have to venture out you don't have anybody showing the way showing you the way and uh, so you, you kind of learn on your own in, in many ways that's cool and, and and so when you think about that like have you always and we're talking about prior to duck donuts but I mean you've you started a couple businesses before this. I mean, were you that sort of entrepreneurial or sort of market invention like It's always earlier? intrigued me, people that uh, had foresight and insight into what's next and being able to uh, kind of conceptualize it and, and go with it. So I've always been intrigued by that. Right. But early on, I, I worked for other companies, primarily in the healthcare industry. And eventually, um, I was in the healthcare in industry about 30 years. But uh, about 20 years into it, I decided I wanted to go out on my own, and I started my, uh, I've always had that itch to do something on my own. And um, I started with another gentleman, a super insulated home business back in the 80s, still kind of in, in healthcare. And then eventually I started my own management company and was buying and operating uh, assisted living, independent living facilities. And when was that? Well, how old were you when you, you broke off and started your own thing? I was probably, uh, early 40s. So early 40s. So so that's a great point. I mean, I I really broke out from doing my corporate thing when I was around 38, uh, 37, right? And a lot of people, the misconception for you guys watching out there, the misconception is that to do something big, to do this startup thing, you have to be like Silicon Valley. You have to start in your 20s. It's just not the case. And and for those who are watching in your your 40s or even in 50s, it's or even 60s, it is not too late. So I mean that's that's fascinating. So, so you're you're running your uh, your assisted living business, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And and that's probably taking all your time. That's a yes, lot. building it up. And actually, uh, they were all I, I would acquire struggling okay. businesses and turn them around. And so, yeah. So it did. It consumed a lot of time, and uh, but it was fun and very rewarding because we were improving the lives of the patients, yeah. their families, and the staff there. And uh, so it was very rewarding work on top of it. So you're really, I mean, in many ways, you were running a turnaround business in, in, a, in a vertical, in an industry, right? Yes. And that's and that's something that's also a very common trait of any great market inventor is they can see, take struggling businesses or see opportunities where other businesses haven't been successful and they're able to apply their this process we talk about through that and it's and it's funny we we don't talk about the process much but there's a lot of similarities and nothing's easy and there was a lot of risk involved with that um, I essentially had to put everything I had on the line in order to secure the the funds to do something like that so uh, it's yeah, it gets your full attention so, when you when you do that. Yeah, I can imagine. So, so was it bank financing? What was it? A combination? Some bank financing, some uh, mezzanine finance. Yes, just yeah. uh, finding investors. Yeah, so so private, both in public, sort yes. of money, so to speak, and that's crazy. And 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 how did you, at that point, when you're building this, 
how did you manage the stress of that? Like, did you ever th worry about it not working, or did you just say, okay, I know? And we're not talking about duck donuts here. We're talking about what I led was, you to this point. At that point, I was so engaged in uh, leverage that I I couldn't I could worry about it. But if I worried about it, it, it would have <laughs> just sat me in my energy. So it just focused yeah. on what we I knew what yeah. to do, and uh, and I had a good team with me, and uh, we were fortunately we were successful. Well, that's cool. So so okay now. So walk me through <laughs> how you get to assisted living, running successful assisted <laughs> living good turnaround question. business to basically disrupting the donut industry. So how does that happen? What, what were you doing? Like, walk me through that timeline. So, Well, it was uh, 2005, okay. and by that time, things were going uh, pretty well with my healthcare business, and we had a, a, a rental property in the Outer Banks, okay. and my wife and I and uh, some friends were reminiscing about when we were younger and we would go to uh, to the beach on the boardwalk and these hole in the wall places would sell fried donuts yeah. on top of yeah. them. And um, the Outer Banks at that time had no donut shops at all, none. Uh, none of the big names, no one. So um, I saw that as a, hey, what a great opportunity. Let's, it's not here, so let's put it here. Yeah. And uh, we put our heads together and my wife and I primarily, and we came up with the um, kind of the, the idea of making it a beach theme, people are on mm -hmm. vacation, yeah. relaxed and, and fun, and um, come in and not in a hole in a wall place, but essentially walking out with the same thing with maybe more uh, a variety of uh, toppings. And yeah. uh, so we built, we built a business around that initial idea. The hardest part was really kind of finding the, the right formula of mix and shortening and, uh, and the toppings that we were gonna do. The conceptualizing was the easy part. That was hard. And then the hardest part of all was trying to make a, na a name for yourself. And it, it took several years before that uh, kind of kicked in. In fact, uh, we used to high five each other when we would have a $300 day, and, uh, wow. which was just ridiculous. And today they're doing eight eight, nine thousand yeah. dollars uh, a day in the busy season. So we've come a long way since uh, the yeah. early stages. So and, and let's talk about that. So like I still like a lot of people are watching this and you make it sound so casual. It's so easy because I and I know it's not we've that been easy. Through a lot. <laughs> and you're just like, yeah, this is what we did, um, you know, and to your point now you're doing and we we're just talking about these numbers, uh, 52 dozen per hour. Is, in, in uh, one of our fryers, yeah. Fryers, and that's and, incredible. And 30 million donuts per year you guys make. Right roughly. now, right. And that, of course, is gonna keep growing. Yes, it will keep growing. Because, yeah. you know, several years ago, <laughs> you know, you were doing zero donuts. Exactly. <laughs> so, so um, and, and you talked about us a little bit about the Outer Banks in North Carolina. And so those who don't know, the Outer Banks is, a, is really a, an island chain on the outside coast of North Carolina. Um, Duck, uh, Corolla, uh, Kitty Hawk is where the first flight with the Wright brothers were. I mean, it's a great place if you haven't gone. Beaches are awesome. It's beautiful. Um, I go there myself too, so I, I know. And in fact, I was saying earlier that I've been to the original Duck Donuts store. but. It wasn't, when you started this, and I want to get back to a little bit of the concept and how you got the flavors, we talked about that earlier, but you you started two stores at once, right? Right. Instead of just doing one, you're like, I'm going to do two. Right. What was the, what was the, and it was Kitty Hawk, right, North Carolina, and, and, and Duck, Duck that's, that's and thus the name. Right. So so what was that like, We're opening up those two first stores? And when, and when was this? What year was this? When you opened we opened first? in 2007. Okay. We started the idea in 2005, actually became operational in 2007. So it took some time to get through uh, working with the local municipalities and getting yeah. permits and uh, getting the, the concept approved and then um, introducing it to the community. It took, took a while. Um, but I had never been really in retail before and so it was, a, it was an eye opener for me. And plus, we didn't know how it was we had no idea how it was going to be received. Right. And we found out the first two years, we found out people liked it, but nobody knew who we were. Right. And, but as time went on, uh, through word of mouth and people coming back every year to the Outer Banks who vacationed there, we built a name for ourselves. But about the third year, we, we, then we about broke even. Yeah. And, uh, and then from there, it just took off. And, and I mean, you were and are now an icon of the area. 
You're too and you, you don't want to say that, <laughs> no. but I'm telling you, it's a landmark. And, and, and everybody talks about it when you go down to Duck on vacation. You know what the neatest part is? Donuts, you know? That's exactly right. The yeah. neatest part of it is that people have incorporated us into their traditions yeah. and uh, their memories, and they go there, and now we're part of weddings and parties, and people go down there and they make us, a, our name, a part of their celebration, which is really cool. You know, and, and, and that's really important. Um, when we talk about the market invention process, the real market inventors, whether they, whether they plan it or not, and I want to ask you about that, they create an ecosystem around them, a community around them that's bigger than themselves. And, and if you've done it a bunch of times, you can actually try to design for that group and that community when you first have your idea. But a lot of us, when our first go around in market invention, it's like kind of like a byproduct, right? Oh, right. this is great. It happened, you know? Right. So, like, culture, like, building that culture, that just happened organically? Or do you have that vision prior? I did not have a prior. Yeah. Uh, like, like I said, uh, and that's been pretty much my whole life. There was an opportunity. I love a challenge. Yeah. And if you're willing to invest your time in it and take the risk, then you go for it. And, and that's what we did. Fortunately, I still had my healthcare business at the yeah. time. So it took, I wasn't reliant on that as uh, my sole income. And it was a good thing because we didn't make any money for a while. Yeah, so you were um, bootstrapping the whole thing out of your other business. I was, yeah, right. I was funding all the shortfalls. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. But you know, I mean, but that's commitment, right? I mean, you made a decision. Was there ever in a, a point in your a process, thinking process, that you're like, "Well, if it doesn't work, I can go back." I mean, you were were you just set? I'm going to make this work, or were it, was it? The third year, I thought, if this doesn't catch on, then I, I'm going to have to have some serious thought whether to continue. But fortunately, that's uh, when it hit. Huh? That's when it hit. Yeah, that's awesome. And so, you know, early on, obviously, you talked about your wife being a part of the thing. And I think it's really important, and I talk about this uh, in my book and, and others, is having that life partner is extremely important to any real market and better success, having that support system, right? And the team as itself. And you know, actually my kids, they, they were yeah. very involved from the very beginning, awesome. working in the store. So it was a great experience it's for really them family. as well. It's yeah. a family endeavor. So we talked about family and that being part of the business. Yeah. I think that's really important. And I think there's a misconception out there that you have to put your life on hold, relationships and everything else to be a market inventor or be an entrepreneur or do something big. And that's just not the case and you've proven that, right? I mean, that's the same with me. Um, but but I, I just wanna say that for you watching, like don't listen to those people saying like, do not get in a relationship. In fact, finding a life partner can accelerate everything. Um, and so you can do both, so don't listen. So anyways, when we get back to this, so when we walked in, there was no donuts on the racks. Right. And if you think about the legacy market, you know, with the Dunkins and the rest, right? There's donuts on the racks. In fact, a lot of that time, they import them from other locations, right? right? So they don't even make them on site, right? Mm -hmm. So like, what was that like transitioning people that were coming in your store like, okay, you're a donut shop, where are the donuts? They're not used to the process. So what was that like? Um, well, it, basically we educated our, our our customers, you're on vacation, you see a donut sign, it, it's going to be intriguing anyway. So right. that would get them in the door. And we did a lot of uh, education and selling, yeah. a lot of samples, uh, here, try this. And, and quite frankly, uh, we had some people come in and say, oh, I don't eat cake donuts, I just like yeast. And we encourage them, here, just try this. So or we give them away. Honest to God, I can't tell you how many times people would do that, they'd leave. Two minutes later, they open the door. This is the best donut I ever had. <laughs> it changed a lot of minds that way. Yeah. You well, know, so it, and you said something really important there. So when we talk about the make the market phase, which is really when you're when you've got this concept and you're inventing the market, it's about education, right? It's yes. totally about education. You just said it right there. Now we're past the education phase in a lot of ways, right? We're in now the iterate and expand phase, as we say. Right. And so now, let's talk about that. How have you adapted? How have you changed, evolved the business? And how to stay relevant from going from a local, like Outer Banks vacation donut to being this now national franchise, global franchise, and being one of the fastest franchises in the world? Like how, how, how do you do that? Well, we're trying to play with the big boys, really. Um, we do a, a lot of marketing, mostly through uh, Word of mouth and, and right. word of mouth, but the marketing piece is just staying connected with their community. That's important in, in our business. 
you know, supporting baseball teams and working with schools and fundraisers and uh, through our charity program, Crack is Back, staying as close to the community as we possibly can. We do not want to be viewed as just, just another yeah. chain that's come into town. Yeah. We really want to be a part of the fabric of the community. So that's important to us. And then we have really grown our, our company, become more sophisticated with social media and having a presence out there with constantly putting our name out there. Plus we have convenience is big nowadays. And uh, so we've adapted and we've uh, created online ordering yeah. for our customers. People awesome. have had the experience, but they don't have maybe a few minutes to wait, they're on the go, and maybe they're an office hero, which is another category of customer of yeah. ours, where they like to bring donuts uh, to work with them. It's paid for and ready to go at the time that they uh, requested it. They just have to come in, pick it up, and, and go. So, uh, And then we're also introducing this upcoming year a loyalty program. So uh, we're doing with what the big boys are doing. We're getting there, and uh, we're, to be competitive, you have to. Up. Yeah. It, it's a... Uh, and uh, yeah. we're just about there. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and, and I'll tell you, once you've had a made to order hot, fresh donut from Duck Donuts, you can't go back to the old market. I'm sorry, you just can't. And that's a really success. I share your thoughts. <laughs> I know you, you do. I do. I know, I'm sure you do. So let's talk about it. So obviously very successful and you're still expanding and, and everything else. And, and, and I'm sure, you know, in the back of your mind, you're a pair, you know, um, a little paranoid about other people coming into the market and everything else, but that is a healthy paranoia, as we say. Right. I used to get upset because we've had a, uh, quite a few people who copycatted what we were doing, yeah. but really, we, our team just talked about it. Said, "Look, if we just continue to do what we do well, we don't have to worry about anyone else, and uh, and we protect our brand." But someone is uh, really. Uh, uh, taken our concept and using all our elements, yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll fight that. But by and large, we ignore it and just move on and uh, just do what we do well. Well, and, and what we've seen and uh, the history shows this, anybody who tries to come into your market at this point just validates you guys as the leader. So if they want to come get the real thing, right. they're going to come to you, which is a beautiful thing because they get to advertise for you now. Exactly. It's, and a lot of people don't realize that, that, that they're, the Me Too's are actually helping the market leader all the time. Um, so. Obviously, in the beginning days, let's talk about what was the darkest day for you starting this, inventing this market? Like, what was, what was that like? Dark? I've always had fun with it. Yeah. Uh, challenging was... What was the most challenge, challenge, challenging day? Like, that point, do you think? Early on was going into that third year not knowing if we were going to have another uh, yeah. poor performance yeah. year. Yeah. And, uh, and it was really... Uh, it was just a breath of fresh air to, to be able to see that our customers are coming back and we're building. And I, at that point, I kind of knew that we were on our way. And then we started thinking about subsequent stores yeah. going into our fourth year. That's cool. And, and, and what was like, when did you know that you hit the turning point, the, the tipping point, so to speak? The fourth year, we had a website and people were writing in uh, all the time. You knew it was April when people said, I, you know, I've been waiting all winter. I can't wait to come wow. down and have your donuts. And we, we created this huge fan base. And quite frankly, uh, it was never on my radar to franchise. We, we franchised because our customers encouraged us to do that. Yeah. And I fought it for a couple of years saying, I don't want to, you know, I have a healthcare business. That's how I'm going to end my career. We're just doing this for fun. Yeah. And uh, it became so overwhelming that I thought, you know what? It's going to be, there's an opportunity here. People are asking us to do it. Let's, let's take a shot. And that's what we did. That's cool. That's cool. So going through this process, what keeps you grounded? What's your why? Like personally, you know, obviously your purpose is bigger with the donuts and everything else and disrupting the industry. But like, what's your personal why? Like what motivates you to get through that grind? Um, we're not there yet. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we've had... The most important part of what we do is in the very beginning choosing a partner who's going to represent our brand well, our franchisees, yeah. and take it and do well with it. And uh, we've learned over the years, and we made some mistakes, and uh, it, between choosing the right partner and choosing the right market and location are the, are the keys to the success. And we've made some mistakes, so trying to unwind that and uh, or work around that is is probably the biggest challenge we have right now because it, it affects not just that location, it affects ultimately it affects everyone. So basically, we haven't reached your total vision yet. No, I, I'm not content yet. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. No, that's great. And and uh, it's, and it's not really the number of locations we have. I it's always been my 
feeling that that'll come. If we do well supporting our, our franchisees from a marketing and an operation yeah. standpoint, which is the most important thing we do, the rest will come. That's awesome. And so advice to market inventors out there. You know, you look at a camera, like what kind of advice do you have for them watching this show that are just have an idea or a concept and maybe they have something that they're starting or, you know, maybe they're struggling. Like, so what, what advice would you have? Well, one, recognize that if you're going to get into something, be passionate about it and be willing to take risk. You're going to have to take risk and put it, sometimes put it all on the line. Yeah. But I've employed two characteristics that my dad taught me early on, and that was to, uh, a lot of perseverance and persistence will overcome shortcomings. Yeah. And, and that's what I've employed in everything I've done in the business that I had. So uh, I'm committed to it, and then I'm going to, I'm not going to take no for an answer or I'm not going to accept failure. Yeah, there's no going back. There's no going back. That's right. That's awesome. And so, um, quickly, I know you guys are opening up a couple locations in Chile, right? Yeah, just a quick story about yeah. that. Uh, we have uh, quite a few stores in the Northern Virginia market and yeah. a gentleman there who was a dual citizen, Chile and the United States, has family and, and business there and he had to go back and forth and his kids and his family love our brand and thought with the Chilean culture, uh, they like sweets and they have actually four meals a day where they uh, pair with sweets. He thought this concept would work well. So um, our first store there opens in Jan January 11th is the opening date. So we're excited that'll that's be our awesome. very first international location. And anything else you can cover a preview where that's coming down the pipe for, well, for we have Puerto, Puerto Rico, we just signed a deal wow. with them. That's coming up that's and cool. uh, we're, we're being more intentional now with our growth. Part of, uh, from the reason you brought up with people that are competitors, we want to stay ahead of that. So yeah. uh, we think we know that our brand will be enhanced by having more more locations and uh, it just promotes the brand so uh, we are being more intentional now with our development versus all up to now everything's been organic people having a great experience in one of our locations contacting us and then uh, we work out a deal so that's all going to change in the upcoming year that's awesome Man, it's been a pleasure, really. Hey, it's Adam, been it's been my pleasure. pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been, I mean, everything from going through the duck donut process to just hearing your story. I mean, I hope everyone who's watching this, you got a ton of value as I did. Every time I meet guys and gals like Russ, it's always just impressive what they've done. There's first the guts to do it and the perseverance and, you know, just great, great people. Thank you very much. So, Appreciate that. So again, you know, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, if you have comments of other market inventors you'd like to see on the show, please comment below. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, everyone.